Ladies and gentlemen, if we can uh, all get back here so we can continue our program. Anyone in the, uh, in the gallery, outside, gift shop, if we can get you all back in here. We still have a lot more program for you this afternoon. Somebody would take a look out back and see if people get me back in. Anybody have any questions before we continue? There was uh, somebody in our audience during the last speaker sitting over here that said he had uh, flown F-14. Is he still here? Or can you leave? I know. <clears throat> Not only a personal friend, but also my personal hero. I can promise you he hates that. A bunch of obnoxious air show performers were having dinner at a really nice place in Yuma City, Marysville. I know, I know. There really is a nice place there, and most people don't believe me when I say that. I was sitting next to a, uh, another air show pilot, and um, so I'm going to leave Bill Corning's name out of this because he probably wouldn't want me to tell you it was him. But everyone else in the room was making too much noise, and I whispered to this other grandfather at my three, do you know the quiet guy sitting next to me on this side? His response was negative, which is aviation terminology for no. Well, knowing how excited Neil would be meeting a famous air show performer, I introduced myself and I remember his reaction. I wasn't any. Then he lowered the boom on us and the saga began. Uh, I mentioned that Bill's pits was parked outside next to my 182, and he softly mentioned his F-18 his was parked on the ramp. And after a few other humiliating things, he did mention his name was Waylon, and Bill and I started looking for the back door, and that, my friends, was the beginning of a lasting and beautiful friendship. Absolutely. At this, was, at this point, I was looking for a good reason not to like him. He's tall, young, good-looking, all the things I used to be 25 years ago. My own fantasy. And now it's time to ask him who he is and what he was doing here with us. And to start with, he was Lieutenant Commander Neil Wayland Jennings. Damn, I hate when someone is living my dream. He told us he was about about making a high-speed pass at some, by some aircraft carrier to be named at a later date when all of a sudden his F-14 just disintegrated. It wasn't there anymore, and he found himself with a whole lot of wind in his face. Now, there wasn't enough of that F-14 left to even recognize it, so that to me was scarier than a 17-knot crosswind landing for sure. Now, please don't challenge me on this because I have seen the video to prove this actually happened. Neil reminded me some years later to remember that the lowest bidder made most of these war words. He showed me the video of his personal air show sometime later. It was better than any other act I'd seen. Now he learned his lesson from F-14s and he quickly moved over to F-18s. With that said, and again because I know Neil doesn't like this because he's such a humble dude, this is the good stuff. Commander Neil Whalen Jennings is a retired naval aviator who served the United States Navy for 20 years. He has flown from the flight decks of six aircraft carriers, logging more than 900 carrier landings. During his various assignments, Neil flew the F-14 Tomcat, the A-4 Skyhawk, the F-16N Viper, and the F-18 Hornet. His flight qualifications include adversary instructor pilot F-A-18, instructor pilot F-A-18, airship pilot, and combat strike pilot. During his tenure, Neil deployed overseas six times and flew missions and operations Desert Shield, Desert Storm, Southern Watch, Desert Fox, and Enduring Freedom. He has led strikes against targets in both Iraq and Afghanistan, one of which nearly cost him his life when six SA-3 service-to-air missiles were locked on to his aircraft. During one particular memorial training mission, memorable training mission, see, he ejected out of an alien Tomcat that caught fire and exploded. He has also watched his wingman eject from a disabled aircraft on two different occasions 
and has acted as an on-scene commander coordinating his rescue efforts. During his final tour in the Navy, Neil served as executive officer and commanding officer of FA-18 Hornet Squadron assigned to the USS Lincoln. During his final tour, um, he served as executive commanding honor officer of FA-18 Squadron assigned to USS Lincoln, as I said, while aboard the Lincoln, he planned to lead dozens of combat missions that were flown over Afghanistan in support of hundreds of American heroes who served on the ground in direct contact with their own forces. Neil's contributions to naval aviation have been memorable, and he has lived through and witnessed some of the most turbulent periods and crowning successes of recent naval history. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge Neil's true commanding officer, who is also here with us today, and that's his wife Susie. Her gift to Neil has been two beautiful kids and a lot of patience. While Neil was at sea, she was the commanding officer of their two teenagers. It is my honor and privilege to introduce Commander Neil Jennings, United States Navy, retired. Hear Larry talk about that guy, who well, I'm not sure who that person is, but I want to be him. Um, sounds like a pretty interesting and amazing individual. And um, as I was preparing for this brief that I honestly tried to get out of doing, I um, started looking down at all the stuff that I'd done, and I was starting to feel pretty sporty, and uh, thinking maybe I am somebody. And then, of course, I go look in the mirror, and I see a gray old uh, washed up, but gray hair wrinkled guy, and I am brought back to reality but um, I'll tell you you know there are a lot of guys um, like me who are just your average American people who showed up with enough of the right physical capabilities to not get washed out of the physical and uh, we showed up with just enough intelligence not a lot of intelligence but just enough to uh, pass those initial tests and, um, and we joined up and we became uh, naval aviators and we lived through some amazing times and um, hopefully I'm going to tell you about a few of those. Um, I want to acknowledge um, Smokes standing up in the back there. Uh, he and I were almost water mates. That's another one of those guys. He's another guy just like me who uh, raised his hand, went to fly airplanes and he actually preceded me by a few years uh, as, a, as an adversary pilot one this morning I'm going to talk about. But um, we are all over and you don't know who we are, and there's probably a lot of you in the crowd who have done far greater than we have, uh, and um, those of you who have served the military and have spent time serving your country in other ways, and have built businesses that make this country uh, great and have helped to run businesses, my hat's off to all of you, because without you, nothing that the military uh, does would ever happen. So what I'd like to do for the next um, 30 plus minutes, I, I don't know how long this is going to go, I threw some uh, pictures together and I'm hoping that they turn out good for you guys. Uh, and I'm just going to tell some sea stories and some things that, that I lived through and, and stuff that I did because I wish I was a historian, but I'm not. I don't really know uh, that much about history, so I'll try to say a couple of historical things and probably get them wrong. But uh, before I go to that, what I'm, I would like to acknowledge that we are in a museum that does largely celebrate this uh, phenomenal machine called a helicopter, which is one of the ugliest mixtures of parts that are all moving in uh, rotation at the same time. By the way, I'm, I'm not just going to insult helicopters, I'm going to try to insult everybody and everything while I'm up here. But um, for the 100th anniversary of naval aviation, I thought it was uh, good. There's at least uh, two or three helicopters that are painted up with the uh, 100th anniversary logo, and this is one of them. And uh, it is an honor to be here at this beautiful museum with so many amazing displays. It's, uh, it's gorgeous. It's, it just takes your breath away when you look around and you see, uh, see all of the collection of uh, interesting equipment that is here. How did they all get it here? It's just uh, it's incredible. It's, a, it's really a great display. First thing uh, I'd like to talk about is just the history of the world. Um, and really, the only relevance of, uh, of bringing the history of the world out was, uh, you know, I wanted to bring, okay, where does naval aviation really fit into this? We're celebrating uh, 200 years, or I'm sorry, 100 years of naval aviation, and it's that little piece, that little blue line all the way in the, on the right side. If you are with me and you believe, uh, you know, the world started with Adam and Eve, and it's going to end in Armageddon, so we don't know when that's happening, but 
there is that little slice of naval aviation. So that's really where we're at. So we have to remember there's a lot of other people who've done other things in terms of war fighting than us. But that's what I know about, and I'm in there too. And then so if you just take that little blue sliver there and you blow it up, and we've got 100 years of mostly excellence uh, in there. And then I was thinking the other day, why should I really give this brief? I'm, I'm a washed up retired fighter pilot who wishes he's still good and can't. And so, uh, you know, we should get somebody here who is still flying because that's the guy who you want to listen to. And then I started realizing, gosh, uh, I've really been around the aviation for 25 years. And so that's one quarter of this uh, of this whole piece. And I don't know much about it, except um, I know that there was a guy named Eugene Eli who kicked this all off and then got a beautiful uh, replica of his airplane and his actual helmet and his actual compass sitting over there in the next room. And a couple days from now, on January 18th, marks the day that he actually launched off of uh, the shore, landed on a ship, caught, uh, caught a uh, rope, connected some um, bags of sand, pulled to a stop, got off, congratulated everybody, he had a, he had a bandolero crisscross of a couple of inner tubes off of, I think, a bicycle. That was his survival equipment right there. And then uh, he got back in his airplane, took off again, and, uh, and flew uh, safely to shore. And he is the beginning of naval aviation, and that is 100 years. The Navy actually celebrates the birthday in May because that's when uh, they, they feel that it was officially stood up as, uh, for, for the Navy. But as far as I'm concerned, on the 18th of this month, when we're celebrating uh, the actual birth of naval aviation. Um, oh, by the way, I know if you're looking at that little yellow part over there, of course, uh, it's all about me, right? I started just after Vietnam, and so I got to ride what was the very tail of the Cold War hops and go through Desert Storm and uh, Afghanistan and some of those things. And, but I'm going to tell, I'm just going to pick out a few steep stories from those and uh, throw some pictures up there. That way, if you're getting bored, uh, you can at least have something nice to look at and say, I'm just me. This is my, more or less, my resume. I was kind of figuring out, okay, I got a bunch of airplanes. Larry listed them all. I'll go back through them. I've been in 12 squadrons and a strike fighter wing. And then, um, you know, somewhere in here, they more or less grounded me. And then uh, I went over to the dark side and joined the uh, defense industry. And now I'm an arms dealer. So, um, this is each one of these, though, uh, you know, Desert Storm, Aggressor Squadron. Uh, I was a crash investigator a couple of times. I'm just going to try to pick something from each of those. But um, we'll, we'll start off, though, by uh, just honoring for a quick minute, uh, moment those who came before us, because I think it is significant. And um, when they first started figuring out how to operate airplanes from ships, a lot of the things that they figured out in those early days, they're still doing today, and the arresting gear with the wire that you pull out that, that rolls the plane to stop. That started like on the very first landing, and they're still rolling a plane to stop by a wire today. Um, a couple of things I wanted to point out from Eugene Eli's picture, because you probably won't find much of this in the, in the history, or you have to really look for it. Is when you when you see him taken off from the ship, you notice the downward uh, angle of his airplane as he's trying to struggle to stay in the air. One thing that really strikes me about this is the, um, the steering wheel that he's using for his elevator control is all the way back, almost to his chest. So he's doing his best to save the airplane and not crash into the water. And then the last thing is, as he bottoms out on this, his wheels actually touch the water and they're skidding along for a little ways before he gets enough speed and uh, arrests his rate of descent and, and gets airborne again. So that was his first takeoff, which was in November, uh, preceding his takeoff and landing. And uh, we nearly lost him on that day, I think. So we're probably lucky that one worked, uh, but it did. And um, the one thing I love about Eugene Eli is, is he was a pragmatist and he was a flyer at heart and he would never give that up. And one of his famous quotes was, uh, he was asked about retiring after taking off and landing on the uh, ship. He said, I guess I will be like the rest of them and keep it up until I am killed. And of course, he did not disappoint anybody in that fact. He knew that there was a good chance that he would die flying those airplanes. And he went out there and one day he was in a dive, he couldn't pull it out hit the ground in his plane and, and turn it into a ball of uh, unrecognizable canvas and, uh, and sticks. And oh, by the way, he wasn't even wearing seatbelt, which actually was a little bit helpful because he was able, just before the plane to hit the ground, to jump free of the wreckage. So he made it free of the wreckage, but he still died uh, due to his impact injuries. And uh, uh, I thought that was pretty phenomenal. You know, the guy was fighting right up to the very end. He knew he was probably going to die flying, but he was never going to give it up. And, that's the kind of pilot I was, and I think that's the kind of pilot that most of the people who are in the military now would say that they are or, 
probably a lot of them are. Uh, and uh, I think uh, he did a great job by blazing a path for the rest of us to follow. Of course, uh, if we're really talking about the history of naval aviation, we could not neglect to mention um, uh, Theodore Ellison. And he was uh, 40 years old when he kind of crashed a plane that looked a lot like this one. And he was on a night flight, night navigation flight, navigating the Kentucky River. Who would ever think about doing that with no instruments? I mean, nowadays, I wouldn't do it. That's crazy. Uh, but he was out there learning the lessons, figuring out how to invent things that would eventually turn into flight instruments that they could use to navigate successfully at night. And he was also a uh, half player. Um, OK, enough of that. Uh, I want to talk about me. That's what I'm here for. They told me I could talk about me. So this is all about me from here on. I would say. Uh, uh, when I first joined in, I got my wings and I was assigned to fly the F-14 Tomcat. It was a Cold War warrior. We would go out and intercept the Russian aircraft um, as they would come out and fly against a ship. And, and we had this game that was going, right? As soon as we were within their range that they could fly against us, they wouldn't announce when they'd come, but all of a sudden they would show up and they would come and fly by the ship. And the game was, they wanted to prove that they could get inside of 200 miles of the ship before we could intercept them. And the reason that was a game was because they had a missile that they could shoot at about 200 miles, give or take, probably a little bit less. And that missile could take the ship out. So now the ship has got a collection of 5,000 people, uh, but most importantly, um, you know, it had our stereo because when we went overseas, we bought really nice stereos and big speakers to bring them back. And um, so our mission as fire paws was to protect our stereo. So this is, um, as a West Coast guy, and I only cruised out of the West Coast, uh, most of the time, coming out of uh, San Diego, with, you know, you see California way over here, and of course, there's Hawaii, and then from Hawaii all the way to the south tip of uh, South Africa, that was basically uh, patrol zone, and 7th Fleet could send us anywhere they wanted in that area, depending on what was going on at the time. And of course, there was a thing called a bear box, and the bear box was just that little, literal piece of the planet where the... Uh, TU-95, I think is the destination, bear uh, bombers from um, the Russians, the Ruskies, could fly to, and uh, anytime our aircraft carrier was out there, they might get to us. So as soon as uh, we entered the bear box, from that point on, during daylight hours, we were standing alert, sitting in the cockpit with our little hat on, because it kept the sun off of us, our sunglasses, because they look cool, and then we had these things in our ears that had our little uh, cassette tape deck, and we'd have to flip our tape over as we were playing it, and usually something to read, and that's how we stood alert. And if they told, if they all of a sudden came up on the um, on the announcement system on the carrier and said, now launch the Alert 5 fighter, it went through the entire ship. And every guy on the ship would turn the TV on, turn it to the channel that's got the, uh, the flight deck, because there's a channel on the TV where it's always showing the flight deck. And they would, uh, they would click their stopwatch on their watch, and they would go, okay, that, that lucky guy better get off in five minutes, because if he doesn't, his name's dirt. Uh, and you got five minutes to, to get your hat off and put your helmet on and start the jet up and get the alignment and go. And uh, then as soon as you got airborne, you know, you'd be on the catapult uh, going from zero to 150 miles an hour in less than two seconds, rocketing off into the air. If you were lucky, you would uh, be able to go plug into a tanker if there was one airborne waiting for you. And you'd go get some gas out of that guy and then the likely afterburners race out to 200 miles. Now, as we're waiting out there at 200 miles, and why wouldn't we just go all the way out there? Well, we practiced that. I mean, we practiced these tactics where we could go out a thousand miles and wait for them and intercept them there and come back home, which is just an amazing distance, especially over water, especially if you eject out there, you're not going to get picked up for two days at least. But um, we would, uh, we finally figured out, well, there's no sense in letting them know our actual capability. Let's just go to 200 miles and wait. So we would, and they would come inbound, and as they came inbound, and this is a TU-9, TU-95, I think it's a TU-95. My memory is getting old, so forgive me if I misspeak here, but um, we join up on the bear bomber and then escort them around. This is uh, an A-6 aircraft that's with them. I took that picture. I relieved the A-6. He had been escorting him for about half an hour, and then I got to go out and tag up and take over and uh, follow him around for a while. And as soon as we got there, I would always roll up, show him the belly so he could see what kind of missiles uh, we had, and then we had plenty of them. And then uh, join up and we passed signals back and forth between the guys that sat in the very back that had like a little observation platform there, and there was a guy back there with a expensive camera that was taking pictures just constantly of us the whole time. So we give them the, uh, the one finger salute, and uh, you know, there was guys who would take uh, pictures of American girls and put them up in the canopy so they could show them uh, what they were missing out on. I, I can't remember what they were showing us, but um, 
This was a classic shot. That's the USS Ranger. There's a, um, this is the Badger bomber. There's a, a Badger, and he's being escorted by one of my fellow squadron mates, and then I'm escorting this guy. And I saw this shot coming up, and I had a camera, so I backed off just enough to, uh, to take it just in time. There's probably more just like this on the internet if you ever want to go look. But that's where the little Gomer guy sat. And then this guy right here controlled that gun, and I think this gun too. And he always wanted you to get back there so we could lock you up with this gun radar. But uh, anyway, that was what it was like to be a Cold War guy, and uh, that was a lot of fun. And then, of course, the Cold War ended, and then uh, things changed drastically for the Navy. And of course, right almost immediately after that, we entered a period of time that was uh, coming up on Desert Storm. And um, during Desert Storm, our ship sailed into Hawaii. This is us coming into Hawaii. We picked up a lot of our supplies, missiles, bombs, all of that stuff. And then we sailed out of there, went straight to the uh, Philippines. Uh, resupply there and then went over to uh, to Iraq and flew to the shore missions for a number of days. That's uh, F-14 Tomcat. Yeah, that, that's uh, me shooting the E-34 Phoenix. I don't know why I threw that in there. Except, uh, that is a $1 million missile. I uh, felt pretty good to pull the trigger that day and then feel that funk of a million bucks coming off the airplane and see the pollution of the, of the, of the, of the missile going by. But we, um, we, when we were in the air, uh, I was told later that the Iraqis would never fly because they were so afraid of that missile. Because they could go out there and tag you uh, dozens and dozens of miles away, and you wouldn't even know what's going on if you're the guy flying against the Phoenix. They could blow you up in the middle of nowhere with no planes around, and you wouldn't know how it happened or, or uh, where it came from. So, it, uh, but during Desert Storm, we actually didn't fly with the Phoenix. We flew with uh, lesser missiles than that, so they didn't really know what was going on. I can say it wasn't too good. Um, during Desert Storm, I, I got kind of pissed off one day because I was thinking, gosh, we're flying a lot of uh, combat air patrol. CAP, CAP, we're flying a lot of CAP missions and we're not getting a lot of action and there's nothing going on and we're not doing any training at all. And training is actually one of the funnest things you do. So, um, you know, we're, we're flying with four Sidewinder and four Sparrow missiles, so we're pretty loaded with light missiles out there. And uh, one day I got together with my wingman and I said, if you tell anybody a thing about this, I'm kill you. But what we're going to do is we're going to go out there and we're going to practice some 1v1 maneuver, you know, dogfight, because that's fun. And so um, we had our, our tankers. Uh, I was, I was on the Ranger at the time, uh, and uh, we're down here kind of in the South Gulf, and then we had our tankers, a stack of four KC-135 Air Force tankers with about 135,000 pounds of fuel each, parked up there uh, north of our, our ship, and then up here about 40 miles north of that, we had our cap station, our job was to keep the Iraqis from coming out and uh, rolling up the ship because they might sink our stereos, and we don't want our stereos to go to the bottom of the ocean. So, um, you know, same kind of stuff, just a different war. And so, uh, we came up with this plan where we would uh, we would come off the tanker, go set the station, then the first guy would come back down, go get some more gas, and then as he's coming up, the second guy would come out to meet him, and we would uh, mix it up right there in this huge 1v1 for a ball. So there we were, just uh, maneuvered away, full afterburner, had our air on fire, just having a great time, just uh, just sourcing all over the place, pulling a lot of G's, just really having fun. We're being in a war, that's about as good as it gets. And then, uh, as soon as the first guy got lowest on gas, we had to break the fuel state, I think, 7,000 pounds. We got 7,000, remember, get that first, peeled off first, went back to the tanker, he got some gas, and uh, and then as soon as he got his gas, then the other guy went and got his gas, and then we did it again. And we did this for four hours straight one day on a combat uh, mission, and uh, two of the tankers had to go home early out of the four that were on the station because we had taken so much of their gas. And we did this like four or five times, and they never figured out what was going on, but all of a sudden the tankers didn't have enough gas. And so, uh, you know, we're burning through it, like, uh, you know, we're burning through a tanker, a whole tanker full of gas about once every uh, hour or so. And so, finally they figured out someone's taking too much, and from that point on, they came up with a number and they said, this is all the gas you get, you got four hours on station, use it however you want, but you're only getting this much, and from then on it was over. So, that was probably uh, one of my favorite experiences of Desert Storm. I've got a few others uh, to tell you about. One I wanted to uh, hit real quick was um, one night uh, we're on this cat called Bomb Cat, and it's uh, this lane. It's a, a lane patrol that goes from the border of Saudi Arabia right down here, and the tankers are south uh, in Saudi Arabia, and of course here's the border with Iraq right there. Uh, and um, then we're patrolling north and south up to Baghdad. 
Well, on the first uh, trip up there, we get almost to the outskirts of Baghdad, and um, I'm starting a right-hand turn, me and my wingman, two of us, uh, they're labeled in blue. Of course, the good guys are always blue, and the bad guys are always red, so that's the color coding here. But we started this uh, right-hand turn, and all of a sudden, 20 miles all the way around us, the sky lit up. It was just solid orange, just about, coming up out of the ground, and there were these nice little McDonald's arches, arcs, fire that were bullets coming out of this uh, 23 millimeter guns. They had them all the way around us for 20 miles, every direction you looked. And um, right after that, our radar was warning receiver goes up and tells us we're being tracked by surface air missiles. And so I look out at my left nine o'clock, I'm halfway through the turn, and the surface air missiles are coming from about where that position is at Red Star. I look out at my left nine o'clock, and I see not one, not two, but six SA-3s coming up off the ground, and they're heading our direction. And from the distance we were at, maybe 12 uh, miles or so, all you can really see is these little pinpoints of light from the rocket motors that are, that are pushing that thing upward. And the Tomcat on its best day might be a Mach 1.5, 1.8 fighter. The SA-3 uh, on its best day is a Mach 3.5 uh, telephone pole that has a nice gigantic warhead that's coming after you to, to kind of make your day go bad. So, of course, uh, as soon as I realized that he was targeting me, my wingman, he was clean. He had nothing on his radar warning receiver, no, it wasn't him. So he just uh, climbed up and just hung out and watched. And uh, I think he was having a pretty good time. I wasn't. But uh, I took a slight bit away from the guy because I knew I could have a chance of flying outside of his tactical range. And uh, lit the afterburners, accelerated all the smog, and started through my maneuvering set. And as we're going through the maneuvering set, I'm asking my Rio, this uh, guy named Bill C. In, in the background. By, by the way, side story, Bill C, good looking guy, like Superman type looking guy with the big Hollywood pin, you know, really blonde hair. He's got all, he's like the, sur the surfer dude on steroids. And um, he had this beautiful, willowy young wife uh, who, um, on the day that he left to go on cruise, I see her on the ramp and we're talking and, um, and she is really worried and I can see she does not want him to leave. So I went up there and said, Kathy, don't worry. Uh, Bill's fine with me. I'll take care of him. I'll bring him back. And so, of course, these missiles are tracking on me, and what am I thinking in my mind? Holy crap, I'm not going to bring him back. You know, I, I was thinking, I just I just blew that. I shouldn't have told her anything. Because uh, if we get blown up and fall out of the sky here, it's going to be bad for uh, bad for me and bad for her. But anyway, we're on our way out now. We're doing our maneuver reset. And I come up on the on the uh, in intercom system, and his call sign was Ghost. And I said, uh, he goes, um, you have the jammer turned on. He's like, yeah, it's turned on. I'm like, uh, is there a light? You know, and the light was just basically that it was, it was uh, giving the signal back. It was receiving signals and giving a signal back. And he's like, yeah, light's on. I'm like, uh, did you dump some chat? He's like, yeah, dump some chat. I'm like, do we have any chat left? And he's thinking, I just answered three yes questions. This question must be a yes question. So he's like, yeah, we got some chat left. I'm like, why do we have chaff left? We're not going to need it later. Dump the rest of that chaff now. Chaff is thin strips of aluminum, and they foiled the radar, and um, they were perfectly cut to match up to the radars that these guys are using. So I couldn't figure out any reason why he was keeping the chaff. We were going to need it later, and um, so of course he got an F on that, an A on the first three, and an F on that. So as we're maneuvering, and the rocket motors burn out on the missile, and it's pitch black outside. What do you think we see out there? We don't see a damn thing. There's nothing there. We can't find those missiles. We can't see them. Once rocket motors are burned out, it's a three and a half mock telephone pole that's gliding directly towards us. It has a, it has our number and wants to hunt us down. But after what seemed like an unbelievable long time, uh, we saw some bright flashes go off behind us. And I took that as they were command detonating the missile from the ground. What happens is. The missile's coming after you, right? And it's a big piece of hardware, and there's innocent civilians on the ground beneath them, and they know that, and they don't want to kill their own guys. So if they realize that the missile's not going to hit the airplane that they're trying to target, they'll push a button, and they'll explode it up there at uh, 30,000 feet, rather than and let it come down in small pieces, rather than having the big chunks come down and maybe take out uh, you know, large number of people on the ground. So when we saw the bright flashes, I felt a little bit better, but I left the afterburner go. And I went straight back down, all the way back down to the tanker. I was almost out of gas by the time I hit the tanker. I just had the afterburners going and going all the way back down there. We pumped all the way back up to top off our gas and then started north again. But we didn't go nearly as far north the second time, so uh, that was that. I sort of got in trouble from that one from my skipper. And I don't even remember why he was so mad at me. I just remember he was pissed. 
Um, by the way, you know, some of these you're going to think, what the heck is this knucklehead? Why did we, the American taxpayer, let this knucklehead have a $30 million airplane and fly this thing around? And I'm just going to tell you, I'm going to caveat and say, hey, these are some of my most colorful stories. In 20 years of flying, you can imagine that there was maybe some other things I did where I didn't take quite as many chances or didn't have uh, as close of a call, but these are the better stories. You don't want to hear about that because you'd already be asleep. So it wasn't long after I left my Tomcat squadron, I got to be an adversary pilot in the in Air Force Call Set in Brussels, and uh, I was flying out of Miramar Fighter Town, USA. Um, that was one of our plane caps, and, and I just want to tell you, that was the first uh, squadron I got to where there was women in the Navy, and it was actually a good thing. Our male plane captains were a little stinky and not so good looking. Our female plane captains did their hair up, they wore perfume, and when they strapped you in to your little Air Force guy, you felt kind of special. Um, that's uh, Maria, and I can't remember her last name. She was she was one of the two plane caps that I usually uh, got. A really nice girl. Uh, we flew the F-16, uh, and it's a Navy version. And we also flew the A-4 Skyhawk, both uh, beautiful aircraft. Um, the A-4, of course, being a Vietnam uh, era light attack bomber. But as it turned out, it made a great adversary aircraft. It was the same size and with very similar maneuverability to some of the Soviet aircraft that we were training the F-14 guys to fight against. So it turned out to be a uh, good plane. Of course, uh, you know, the, the thing about manning up an F-16 and climbing the ladder on that thing, I don't think I ever had a day when I went out there and climbed in an F-16 and I didn't have a huge smile on my face and I love flying that plane. But I just want to tell you one little story about, um, about this. Um, in the F-16s we had, we painted all up in this blue paint scheme, which was just, uh, just gorgeous. It, it made them semi-recognizable because the colors were pretty uh, contrasting, but when the F-14 guys got to the merge with us, they knew who was who and they didn't accidentally shoot their, their wingman because they could always tell who the bad guy was. But one day, um, you know, as I said, the, uh, the bad guys are in red and that was us uh, this day. And we were down there south of San Clemente Island. Of course, uh, just a real quick slide QA. Here's San Diego and there's um, Tijuana and uh, San Clemente Island is off the coast of San Diego and uh, Catalina Island would be right up about right here, which you probably uh, know pretty well. But there was a pair of Marine F-18s that were uh, coming down, and they were fighting against um, me and my F-16 and my wingman and my NSA-4, and uh, my wingman was simulated MiG-21, and I was a MiG-23, which meant I had full afterburner uh, any time that I went straight, and I could go as fast as I wanted to go. I had some maneuvering limitations with Jays, but, uh, but we really expected the guys to go out there and slaughter us, and on the first run, you know, they're coming down and they're, they're heading towards us. For some reason, the wingman isn't doing a very good job with his radar, so he doesn't get a radar lock. And the flight lead calls Fox 1, which is a simulated air to air missile that's coming down to blow up one of our planes. And the lead was targeted on the A 4, so he took the A 4 out. And so the A 4 ends up um, peeling off. He's the dead bandit making the left hand turn there and he's going south. I'm still alive, so I still get to go in and I'm thinking, well, this is a good day. At least maybe I get to see an airplane. Some days you go out there and you wouldn't even see an airplane. They shoot their missiles, they go away, and you go back to your station and you start over and do it again. So as I'm heading toward them, they, they turn right miles out in front of my nose. They're making a turn and they're going back north, which was really a, a tactical mistake. Everyone who flies those. You can't do that because uh, it usually turns out bad. So I like the afterburners. Now I'm chasing these guys down, and so I get right behind the guy on the right, and I call an AFID. It's a little, uh, it's a Soviet missile, uh, and I kill him with an AFID. And I go over to the guy on the left, and I kill him with an AFID. Now I'm just laughing so hard. You know, I'm a big 23, and I just killed two F-18s, and especially the Marines because I hated those guys. And uh, you know, Navy pilot. So as I'm laughing, and I still got the afterburner lit, and I go by these guys, and I go by the left guy about 200 feet, which is way inside of the uh, rules. We're supposed to be 500 feet, and so I'm just going by, I'm blowing his doors off, and I've got at least 250, 300 knots of overtake, and I'm watching him, and just looking at him, and just laughing so hard. And uh, so then I look up into my uh, heads up display, and I notice that I'm doing 850, and it's like, oh, shit. Sorry about that, that word. Yes. Um, and as I realized, I recognized that my red line in the airplane was 780 and I'm going 850 and that's not good because the canopy doesn't do good things at those speeds. So I pull out an afterburner and pull 9Gs straight up and I'm thinking, okay, I'm just going to try to bleed my speed here and slow down as quick as I can. And as I do that, I, uh, I do slow down. I end up at uh, 220 knots at 33,000 feet within like seconds. And uh, I'm like, wow, that looks weird. I didn't realize I was going to climb so fast. 
And of course, taking that canopy 850 knots superheated down at 10,000 feet, relatively thick air, and going up to 33,000 feet, thin air, super cold air, uh, what do you think happened? The thing, uh, the thing uh, popped. It, it made the loudest bang I've ever heard in the cockpit, and it was spider webs going from front to back, covering the entire canopy. And so uh, the gear flap lever, the F-16s, is a little kind of uh, wimpy switch on the left side. I moved that down so I could get the flaps down, and I did a spiral all the way back down to 10,000 feet, thinking if the canopy blows off here, this is going to be a bad day, right? So then I did my uh, my walk-up machine back to uh, the base, and all the way back there, I'm flying at gear speed, so uh, I don't put extra pressure on the canopy because I don't want it to come out because it's got it's cracked, the whole thing is shattered, and uh, and it's just holding in place somehow. I don't know how. And I go back and I'm thinking, what am I going to say? You know, and, uh, I can't figure out what to say, and I'm just I'm thinking, I'm racking my brain. I don't have a good reason or excuse for breaking that canopy. So no cover story. I'm going to have to let them talk first. That's my only, that's the only thing I can do. They have to talk first. I pull up into the line. My crew chief is shaking his head. He's this, uh, you know, ex-Air Force guy. And he's just looking at me like this. And he's like, oh, this. And I, I know he's pissed. And I'm like, gosh darn it. You know, i got to think of something to say. And I can't think of anything. So I get down the clock, climb down the ladder, and I'm waiting. And I'm trying not to talk. And he talks first and goes, I knew that was going to happen. And I'm like, did you know that was going to happen? What are you talking about? He said, like, see those little cracks right up there on the uh, front of the windscreen? I knew that was going to uh, cause a stress fracture and break your canopy. I'm like, you jerk, why'd you let me take that plane? And, and I'm like, how long will it take you to get that fixed? And he's like, oh, a couple days. And I'm like, what's that cost? Uh, oh, $200,000. Oh, you shouldn't have let me take it and I'm like that. I can't believe you let me take that plane. I never told a soul that story for two years. And uh, I wasn't sure what they were going to do if they found out I broke a $200,000 canopy. But as it turned out, I got a chance to break some other stuff too. And that was, uh, that was fun. Um, you know, of course, being a uh, F-16 guy flying uh, and an A-4 guy flying the adversary mission was, uh, was a lot of fun. But it also turned me into a mishap investigator. And um, we had four planes crash in the two years that I was in this or three years I was in the squadron. One of them was an F-16. It was this F-16 on this day. I was in 20 Falls, Idaho, a good friend of mine. And uh, he takes off. They, uh, they carve a, uh, an area down the, the runway to clear the snow, and he takes off down this uh, this area where it's just barely winding up for a car. He's going an F-16. Gets airborne, <clears throat> goes up to maybe 19,000 feet in the clouds, gets disoriented, pops out of the clouds six miles from the runway, going straight at the ground, 600 knots, and uh, doesn't pull out. And so, uh, unfortunately, um, that was my first experience of standing on the edge of a hole, uh, smoking hole. This is your typical smoking hole. And uh, looking in and having the smell of jet fuel and the weight on my shoulders, uh, my buddy just died there. And uh, that was, that was the, one of the toughest things that I've done. And I, I can say today the Navy is much better. They, they figured out a lot of things from this crash. When we did our investigation, we came up with some recommendations, and the Navy took them a couple steps further, and they came up with, with some new techniques to prevent this kind of crash from happening again. But it still happens on a too regular of a basis, but not nearly as often as it did then. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, in my career, I've done uh, five mishap investigations, and that was uh, the first one and just one of them. The other one I want to tell you about was after I went back to the fleet to be a Tomcat guy, and uh, it was my honor and privilege, but uh, maybe dubious honor and privilege, to, uh, to get to investigate a mishap uh, from the, the nation's first female fighter pilot to die in a fighter jet, and that was Karen Holbrey. Uh, her mom wrote a beautiful book about her, if you ever uh, have a chance to read it, it's called Call, Call Sign Revlon. Tells a lot about her, but we spent just an unbelievable amount of time, and the Navy spent a lot of money trying to get this jet back so that they could do a thorough investigation to find out what actually went wrong and what it was in this flight was um, there was a little bit of pilot technique involved and she, it was her second time ever to be flying out to the boat and to do boat landings and um, she saw an engine coming around the corner on the approaching her. That's, uh, that video I think is still on YouTube somewhere if you, if you Google Carol or you might find it but uh, she, was a, she was a stellar aviator and did a great uh, great job except she just was one of those days when she had a bad day and, and being a mishap investigator on that one, I kept asking myself over and over again, what if that had happened to me? Could I have recovered? You know, would I have been okay? I'm not sure uh, 
I can't answer that question this day, but uh, it was a tragic loss for our squadron and for the nation. On to uh, brighter things. Um, in addition to being a mishap investigator, I was actually involved in a mishap too. And uh, just to set this up, we're on our way home from cruise, and we're within just a few weeks of arriving back in uh, San Diego again. And uh, there's Guam, about 800 miles from where we are. And we had just passed through the Philippines, Sea of Philippines, in between the islands the day before, and we're only a couple hundred miles from there. So we're in the middle of the ocean, and it's uh, fortunately it's a really deep part of the ocean, 17,000 feet of water, uh, which helped out because then they wouldn't go look for the airplane to find out what really went wrong. I'm not going to tell you. But uh, anyway, um, Willie, if you could bring the movie up. We're doing a low altitude high speed flyby in the USS John Paul Jones, and um, as we're going by the ship, all of a sudden the plane just tumbles wildly out of control. And uh, you can see here, you'll, and you can look this up on YouTube. Just Google uh, F-14 plus explosion or F-14 plus blow up, and it comes right up. Some of your kids may have already seen this. Uh, teenage kids, most of them have seen this. As the jet blew up and, the, and tumbled out of control, we're going end over end at 600 and some knots. And, uh, it was a, an e-ticket ride in one minute. I, all during Kara Holgreen's mishap investigation, I relived her crash hundreds of times. And then I kept wondering, what was she thinking in the final moments? And, um, you know, this day, as we're tumbling out of control at 600 knots, and there's fire, and we're going in over and I was thinking, ah, I know exactly what she was thinking. It went right to my mind, and there was absolutely no fear, no, uh, no remorse, no nothing. You know, I was ready. That was my time, and I, I accepted I was sad for my kids. I lived um, probably a couple of seconds. I lived 45 minutes in thoughts about, uh, you know, my kids losing their parents, my wife being a widow, all those things went through my mind. Somehow, by the grace of God, we had slowed down enough as we're tumbling, and the cockpit actually broke off from the back of the jet, and uh, my back seater was just getting burned like crazy. The fire was all around him, and I was far enough away where it was just warm, and I didn't feel it in. He pulled the handle and got us out, and uh, somehow the parachutes worked and everything opened, and uh, there was no there was no wind blast from the wind at all. So I just say that was God putting His hands around us and just taking us and saying, "Now your time in," and, uh, and somehow we survived that. Anyway, that was uh, one of my experiences. Thirty million dollars uh, of airplane down at the bottom of the ocean, and um, the mishap uh, team uh, they did video analysis of the, of the explosion. They went back and looked records. They looked at maintenance practices, they looked at everything they could find, and there was nothing uh, in all of the allegations that would tell them why a plane would just all of a sudden blow up. So, uh, you know, just put it down to one of those things that they never resolved. And uh, there was actually a switch in the cockpit that was like, don't lift this, don't push this button. I, I happen to do that. I won't tell you that's why the jet blew up. No, there's not really a switch like that. Okay, um, by, by the grace of God, after, uh, you know, flying a Tomcat for a few years, I got to. Uh, to fly that over Iraq and Afghanistan. I've, uh, I've done a lot of uh, interesting flying. We got, I don't remember where we got this jet, but it had the camel paint scheme when we got it. I was, that's me. Um, I was the maintenance officer and I made the maintenance guys put my name on it because it was the only jet that was banned like that the entire airway. And I thought that was kind of cool. So I'm very proud of that But um, it, was a, it was a beautiful plane and it had all of the tools and everything that you need to take your weapons to a delivery point and let them go because the end state of these beautiful pointy nose after burning twin tail uh, you know sexy supersonic fighters is that they carry a weapon to a release point and then they let it go and the F-18 can do that like no other airplane and has the systems where all the switches to control everything you need are underneath your left and right hand they're under your fingers there's 13 different knobs and buttons within you don't have to even move your hands to get to them each one of them has at least four to six different uh, things that it does, depending upon what mode you're in on the radar, what mode you're in on the uh, air to air or ground, what weapon you have selected, they do all different things and it does everything that you ever needed to do. Um, I love that picture, I don't know why. One day, uh, I was uh, flying over at Iraq with uh, my F-18 wingman and uh, we're out there patrolling the no-fly zone, right? The no-fly zone is, don't let those bad Iraqis fly south of this line and if they do, you can shoot them down. And so this was like a green day. This was the only time in probably all the time that I flew over Iraq, which is hundreds of missions, where the Iraqis 
that actually came out, they came down with the fly zone, and this big fly three came down, and he crossed the line, and so, man, master arms coming on, weapons are on, we're, we're rolling in, we're taking out, we're after these guys, we're gonna go get them. We got our afterburners lit, we're heading straight, we're call, already calling up, saying we need a tanker, you know, because we knew we were gonna use up some gas here. And so as soon as we got within about um, uh, 70 or 80 miles, the guy starts a turn, and he lights the afterburners, and he, and he runs north. So now I'm thinking, well, he's trying to sucker us in. There's something going on here. What's going on? So we're looking around for somebody else. Maybe he's got a man down low who's going to try to hook and come up and uh, take us out. Well, he didn't have anything that day. He was just uh, playing chicken with us. And so, <coughs> excuse me. So uh, we chased him and we chased him all the way up to the border. And we get up to the border and there was uh, an airfield up there on the outskirts of Baghdad. And he uh, is still in the afterburners going down to his air pillar. And the guy, uh, believe it or not, he left his afterburner in gauge too long and he runs his plane out of gas. He's coming in the landing pattern, he puts his gear down, he's at the 90 degrees to go, and he's coming in and he runs out of gas and ejects at the 90. So um, I credit that as an air to air kill, but the Navy doesn't think it was. <laughs> so, you know, to me, well, I had a wingman, so really, uh, I only but to me, if he doesn't land, then that's a kill. So, uh, but that was the closest they ever came to, came to shooting someone down, and um, that was that was another one of those uh, great days. Um, I, I just would wrap this up by saying that uh, you know, in the last hundred years, uh, we as a nation and as taxpayers, you have contributed to our military being the best in the world. And we've come a long ways, and uh, threat packages are not the same as what they used to be. The bombs now are one bomb per target, and uh, and they take it out with deadly lethality. Back in uh, Vietnam, there's a storm there dropping dozens of bombs to take out one, tar one target. Now it's just one. They're even looking for ways to make smaller warheads because they don't need as much blast as they used to. Aircraft carriers uh, from the old day have changed quite a bit from what we have now, uh, but everything that was designed and invented over the last hundred years, most of that stuff still survives. Most of everything, the way they take off and land planes on ships, is almost just about the same as from the first catapult launches and the first arrested landings. The, the big difference is, uh, you know, back in the Battle of Midway, you had a chance of losing your aircraft carrier and, uh, and swimming. Nowadays, not so much, although if you look at some of the scenarios, like the Straits of Taiwan and the defense of Taiwan, there is a chance to still send carriers to the bottom of the ocean, depending upon whether we have a good day or a bad day, if we get involved in a scenario like that one. This is actually the, the Yorktown before it sank when the last boat was uh, taken. Nowadays, uh, a strike consists of sitting in a comfortable ready room that's air conditioned, briefing up uh, what you're gonna uh, go do, walking upstairs while the hornets men are still loading the bombs, do a quick, quick pre-flight, make sure that all your systems and bombs and everything uh, are uh, looking good and working. Get in the plane, start it up, take a uh, catapult shot, get in the air, fly out, go plug into the tanker, get some gas, head out uh, on a station, set your bombs and switches, wait for the uh, call, and then go take your target out. That right there is where we've come in the last hundred years, and that's what's happening right now, every day, day and night. Those nights when we are all staying home in bed warm and enjoying our, our uh, peace and our freedom and enjoying not being attacked by other nations. There are guys out there on station, not just in the Navy, but uh, Air Force, Marine Corps, and the Army too, who are out there doing these kind of missions and uh, protecting us. And that's it, and uh, I don't have anything else unless uh, you've got questions. So well, first, we'll do a quick thank you to Waylon, and then we'll just... I'll tell you, they did a fantastic job. Uh, real quick, I want to give you a schedule update. Uh, the F-18 was scheduled to fly over at 2 o'clock. Believe it or not, on this absolutely gorgeous day, they are socked into Travis. They have Tule fog. <laughs> so he's at Travis Air Force Base. He's sitting in the plane waiting for them to give him clearance so he can take off. But it is absolutely zero zero out there, apparently. And he can't get off the ground. So we're watching that. We are going to take the Wildcat, and it's going to take off, though, as soon as we're done here. So he'll start the Wildcat. We're going to see that fly. And we're going to monitor it. Hopefully, we'll be able to, uh, to take off. Um, soon as it clears. So, do we have some questions for Waylon? Yeah, Tom, it's my life to talk to your Army soldier. Did you support the 
main infantry divisions of the U.S. Army, such as the 1st Division in Iraq, mainly the Desert Storm. Because the air power, thanks to you, a lot of GIs didn't get killed. And you were well, I'll uh, tell you, he asked about uh, how much support <clears throat> myself and or I would put it to a bigger to the Navy did during Desert Storm. And, and really, we had the easy job. We flew every day and we were more taking out the ground targets so that when you guys rolled through on the ground, it, it was much safer uh, for you to get to where you were. As a uh, fighter pilot flying the F-14, as long as I was in the air uh, and my buddies and all the F-15s uh, that were up there with their missiles, the Iraqis did not fly much, so they did not represent a threat. But if we hadn't have been in the air, they would have been flying their airplanes out against our troops. Um, so I feel like I contributed in a small way, but really not nearly like what you did. And thank you for your service. Appreciate it. On one of those slides you showed, you showed an F-18 being right reached <laughs> by a pole as the Navy gone How you doing? from a basket to a yeah, Mark. No, the Air Force uh, tankers uh, are configured uh, two different ways my grandson. for most of the most of the tankers. But the KC-135 specifically, they can put on an Air Force um, refueling set or a Navy. The Navy refueling set, the pilot drives the refuel probe, which comes out the right side of, of the forward fuselage, and you flip a switch and it comes out and clicks into place. The pilot drives it up into the basket. And, uh, and connects with the basket, and then the fuel starts flowing. The Air Force, it comes in behind yeah, the cockpit. There's a, the uh, a spot up there, so the pilot drives up, stops, uh, and the operator on the plane <laughs> will, will uh, move the, uh, the refuel set with the wings that are on it, and he will uh, connect to the plane. So it's, it's, a, different, it's a completely different uh, way of doing things. In, in the Navy way, the, the Navy pilot can, makes the connection, in the Air Force way, the Air Force uh, Tanker yeah, operator, weird, but, but uh, two different uh, ways, and I don't think that's going to change. I think that's going to stay the same. And the main reason is the Navy can only um, take two C very small airplanes. They can flip a switch and let a um, a basket out, but they can't ha take a plane to C that's big enough. The aircraft carrier is not large enough to support it. That has a you know, window in the back and a, and a and a different connection. And as long as the Air Force doesn't change. You know, the Navy and the Air Force will always be different in that respect. Hi, uh, season for uh, that missions uh, with remote pilot vehicles and so forth and all the automation. How do you see uh, the future of the here? Well, um, you know, when you talk about UAVs, uh, unmanned aerial vehicles, and uh, UCAVs, I think they're called now, and we're manned combat aerial vehicles, that is the future. That's where we're going. And if you saw Terminator 1, in spite of the fact that it was a really cool movie when it came out, and now it looks a little hokey because the technology isn't as good. To me, that's the future of uh, that. You've got these giant objects that are moving slowly through the, uh, through the battlefield with laser uh, weapons. And they don't even have kinetic weapons. It's just lasers that are being fired out and, uh, and killing things on the ground. I think that's the way the battle is going to go. It's all going to be remote piloted someday. Um, I just feel lucky enough that I got to fly in the airplanes by uh, sitting in a console somewhere and flying over. It was tumbling in over in. How realistic was the movie Top Gun? Top Gun was, uh, had probably the best flying scenes of any movie that had ever been made to that point, probably for 10 years, 15 years after. I don't know of another one that has better flying scenes. It's, uh, um, it's totally unrealistic, though. When you're going through Top Gun, you show up to the squadron way before the sun comes up. You're uh, briefing a mission, you go out and fly, and you come back, and you're debrief. Even if your flight time is only an hour, your debrief is about four and a half, five hours, and then you go do it again. And uh, leading up, to, and then you leave the squadron way after the sun has gone down. And um, the first week is all academics, so you're in a classroom day after day after day, and these long things, lectures, tests, all of this stuff. It's really uh, academically oriented, and it's a lot of talking, it's a lot of work. It's, uh, it's terrible, but it's fun once you're done because you get to wear the patch. <laughs> okay, let's thank Waylon again. Larry. Um, just a reminder that uh, Bill Arkin's book is available in the bookshop, uh, and he'd be happy to sign a copy for you. No, I, I, uh, hear I wouldn't uh, swear to this, time for Bill but as far as Top Gun is concerned, 
the flying was done by a naval uh, a reserve unit, as I understand it, and some of those pilots actually live here in San Carlos, right up on the hill, who did some of the flying for Top Gun. Uh, and I'm about 90% sure that what I just said is accurate. Anyway, I'm glad I don't have to follow Waylon because I just go in the men's room and lock the door because I couldn't do it. Thank you all for being here. Remember, we're going to crank out the aircraft out back and like waiting Johnson. on a call on the F-18. We hope you all stay with us.